Well, here we are, three weeks until the midterm elections, and Democrats are pulling out all of the stops to avoid the red tsunami that you and I know is coming. We'll help you focus on what's important and what to look out for as we get closer. That plus a creepy Joe sighting and a chance to hang out with us in uh, Lee's Summit. That's coming up this week. All ahead on this week's episode of Dale Carter's America. From the heart of flyover country, he's not on the far right, and he's certainly not on the far left. Like you, he's somewhere in the middle. This is Dale Carter's America. Well, is it cold enough for you, Kurt? Yeah, it's getting cold. Yeah. Um, it's colder a lot earlier than it normally is. In fact, a freeze warning for 70 million Americans. It's like 15 to 25 degrees colder, depending on where you are. And in parts of the country, they're getting snow. But I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Uh, this is just the weather. This is not climate change slash global warming. Because whenever you talk to somebody and say, hey, you keep saying the planet's getting hotter um, and it's 15 to 25 degrees colder than what we're used to, they say it's just the weather. But by God, you have a really hot summer day. It's the end of the world as we know it. Well, my experience has been actually like the reason that they say climate change now and not global warming is so that whether it's hot. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's like if it's, you know, unusually hot or unusually cold, then they can say that it's climate change. But if they just say global warming, then obviously that doesn't cover it being cold. So what happens on an average day? Uh then it's climate averaging. <laughs> is that what know. it is? <laughs> Another one of those things that we're going to get into here in a little bit. Um, had a great time hanging out with my good friend Mark Alford, uh, Eric Schmidt, who's running for the Senate in um, Missouri, Ted Cruz, Texas Senator. It was a Friday night in Raymore. You're seeing the picture if you're watching our podcast on YouTube, and you really should. I mean, there are so many ways you can get this podcast. You can get the audio only, and I know a lot of you do that, uh, but when you watch it on YouTube, you get the full experience, like the picture of Eric Schmidt, Mark Alford, myself, uh, my lovely wife, Jennifer, who is right next to Ted Cruz. So obviously he has the taste in the group because he's next to her. Yeah, she's kind of snuggling up to him a little uh, bit. I think she is. And, you know, when I had a chance to talk to him, he gave me crap about, you know, uh, the Chiefs and, and his Dallas Cowboys and yada, yada. And I reminded him that we've got a Texas Tech kid running our team right now. That's right. So That's he right. was uh, really happy about that. And I bought this shirt at the – they had like a booth there selling shirts. I bought a couple of them. This is my favorite one for today. I wore this specifically for the podcast today. It says, good morning, liberals. What are we offended about today? Yeah, it's always something, isn't it's it? It's always something, and we're <laughs> definitely going to get into that. We would love to meet you. Kurt and I will be at the Jackson County Republican Club at Lakewood Oaks Country Club uh, this Thursday night. Now, they're going to do a social gathering at about 6.30, and then they have a dinner and meeting, and uh, they asked me to be – they they asked me <laughs> – what was I doing there? They Axed. asked me to be the uh, feature speaker, and I won't say axed at that point. I will say asked. Uh, but uh, so that's going to be on Thursday night. Would love to get a chance to meet you. Come on out. Uh, they've got plenty of room there at the uh, Lakewood Oaks Country Club. And uh, the head of the Republican Club told me uh, that he'll feed anybody we bring. All right. So I don't know how many people. I mean, Zarda, if you're listening, come on out, man. We'd love to have you <laughs> hang out there. Anybody else that wants to come, it's Thursday night. Uh, Kurt just put up the information uh, on the link there uh, with the uh, YouTube part portion of Dale Carter's America. There. So we got all that uh, housekeeping out of the way here. Um, there is good news out of this horrible economy that we're in right now. If you're on Social Security, your benefits are going to go up 8.7% in 2023 because the uh, Social Security benefits are linked to inflation through the COLA adjustment, the cost of living adjustment that they go through. This is the biggest increase. You know, we talk about inflation being at a 40-year high, Kurt. Uh, this is the biggest increase in Social Security benefits in 40 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, is that really a good thing? It's maybe a good thing for you, but not so much for me. Well, you know, it's going to put Social Security closer to insolvency. But, I, you know, we've talked about this before. Social Security is the third rail of American politics. Right. There's always going to be old people, and there is, and old people vote. Yeah. So there's no way Social Security is going to go away. Uh, the bad well, news... Well, it's, it's going to go away. It's just that, you know, is it going to go away by us actually addressing the problem 
and and fixing the spending and you know making some changes or is it going to go away because we bankrupt our entire country and we bankrupt the social security system well it may be means tested at some point but uh, the problem that you face is demographics you know, you got the baby boom generation, which is huge, going through, and I am the tail end of the baby boom generation, and I just turned 59. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to take Social Security, at least my plan is not to take it until I'm 70, okay? So um, the, the portion of the population that made up the baby boom is such a big portion of the population. I don't know that there are enough of you, Kurt, to support people like me when I get to retirement. Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing that now. We, we have a, an increasingly aging population, as you just pointed out. And uh, that's one of the many reasons why Social Security is becoming insolvent. And I think it's, you know, you, you like to point out that I, I seem to be more idealistic than, than you in many ways. But uh, this is a, a perfect example. I mean, we need, we need politicians that are just willing to tell the truth to the American people and stop uh, pandering, you know, and stop saying, oh, everything's going to be fine. You're, we're not cutting Social Security. We're not doing anything about it because it's just not realistic. Everyone knows, everyone that's paying attention to this issue knows that it's looming on the horizon and that people my age and younger are either going to have decreased benefits or no benefits at all because of what we're doing right now. Yeah. So we need uh, politicians that are willing to tell people the uncomfortable truths, tell them, you know, the things that they don't want to hear, but that they need to hear. Well, with Social Security benefits going up, here's something seniors don't want to hear. Um, they're going to be taxed more because the, the, the tax bracket that that's going to throw them into, you can, you can be taxed on up to 85% of your Social Security benefits depending on what your tax bracket is. And an 8.7% increase, which sounds huge, is going to throw a lot of seniors into a tax bracket that they're not used to. Right. And so, then what? Well, they're going to have to pay taxes. Yeah. So uh, don't don't be spending all that money that you think is coming your way. Um, so Social Security is, is always going to be an issue, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. Well, I guess the question would be, are they going to pay more than 8.7% 8 8 more in taxes, right? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's confusing, and I know it depends on if you're still going to work or not and how much of your income offsets your Social Security. It's a complicated formula. And as we pointed out on this podcast before, I got a D plus in basic elementary math in college. So <laughs> in don't, college, don't hit yeah, in college. Not in elementary school, no, people. No, no, in no, no, college, no, no, no. <laughs> and you know, I took basic elementary math one because you had to have ten hours of math and science. Was it that way when you were in college? Just um, you just had to have something of everything in college. Yeah, I tested out of college yeah. uh, math because well, at one point I knew math, not anymore. But. I'm not going <laughs> to test out of any math. So I took basic elementary math one. Okay, now you got to picture this classroom. It's a bunch of of women who want to be elementary school teachers, and in the back of the room is the basketball team for the University of Southern Indiana and me. Okay, Wait, you weren't on the basketball team. I was not. Okay. Um, and it was taught by the cross country coach. Uh, who had a sense of humor about these sort of things. I got an A. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four. You know, I got an A in that. And then second semester, I took it at night, and it was taught by a high school math teacher with no sense of humor. Mm. And I barely passed. I got a D plus, and that's why I graduated. So math is not my strong suit. But I do know this, uh, that core inflation uh, for the month, excluding food and energy, rose to 6.6%. .6 and once again, we get back to the highest in 40 years. Yep, and we've got a video on that. Let's watch it. Coming in hot, Mike McKee. Have you got the compositional breakdown yet, Mike? Just the detail of things. What got us here? Yeah, it is disappointing, John, when you look at it. Of course, gasoline comes in down for the month, uh, down 4.9%, but that wasn't enough to offset some of the big rises. Shelter, which, of course, everybody is pointing to as the big culprit for inflation these days, is up by eight-tenths, which is a tenth more than it has been over the past three months. There was hope that it might start to moderate owner's equivalent rent up 1%. And that's the uh, calculation that people do for the uh, the government does for shelter. Uh, there was one decline in uh, apparel down three tenths. That's the in inventory stuff that um, Lisa is talking about. Used cars uh, were down by 1.1 percent. We've been waiting for a big drop there, but new cars come in up seven tenths. And then the big uh, thing that probably people were not expecting is gasoline goes down, but other energy goes up. Electricity up four tenths and natural gas up 2.9 percent. 
percent. So a lot of inflation contributors from areas that we weren't expecting. Some had thought that airline fares would go down. They're up eight tenths, and motor vehicle insurance, which has been a, a problem for uh, the Fed all along, is up 1.6 percent. So a lot of underlying inflation that shows no signs of backing off. All right. As he's talking about energy, I think this is a great time to talk about uh, Royal Roofing and Solar, uh, because those are the folks you can do something about it. You can take control because, you know, we just went through a summer, Kurt. I don't know what your electric bill was like, but mine was off the chart. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I just can't imagine what winter is going to be with, with all this inflation. And imagine, if you will, and Austin Watterson, who runs Royal Roofing and Solar, proud sponsor of Dale Carter's America, he'll come out and talk to you about your home, its position, and whether or not solar can make a big difference for you. But if it works for you, Austin is the guy who can put it in. And um, all of a sudden, you won't be renting your utilities from Evergy or uh, the gas company anymore. You'll be basically powering your own home. Yep. Imagine that. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, um, we starting in the beginning of the summer, like the late spring, early summer, uh, maybe around May or June, you know, we had really high energy bills. And then we had to kind of discuss, you know, as many families do, ways to cut down, uh, turning up the thermostat when we're not home, you know, making sure that uh, if we can cool the house with the windows open, you know, at night we do that and, and other things. So that's just a calculation that more people are having to make now. And we just heard, I mean, literally in the last clip that we just played, that natural gas is up. I think he said two, two or three percent. It's going like to be that. crazy. So. You know. This uh, winter is going to be, you know, definitely uh, a challenge for a lot of people. But the sun is still going to be there. If the sun goes away, we're all screwed. Let's let's just say that. I mean, if the sun goes away, we're all screwed. So if your house is uh, positionally accurate for it, um, and if you need a new roof with all the credits that are out there right now, you know what? We talk about all the spending going on and all that. You know, if they're going to do it. Take advantage of it. And Austin's a guy who can navigate those waters with you. Royal Roofing and Solar, 816-540-7057. 816-540-7057. And make sure you tell him that you heard about it here on Dale Carter's America because a lot of his customers are folks like you and me who aren't buying into this whole uh, hype thing that you're getting from the left, but you look at it from a pocketbook point of view, just like Kurt said, and maybe you're making those adjustments at home to your own budget, and, and you need to figure out what's got to go. And uh, maybe this gives you a little breathing room here with 40-year high inflation going on right now. Right. All right, the weekly jobs claim, jobless claims were up last week. The administration continues to tout creating 10 million new jobs. And I'm even hearing economists tout that. And it's like, it doesn't pass the sniff test. We shut down our economy for COVID. Of right. course people were going to go back to work, yet the administration still claims this is a victory for them, that they have created 10 million new jobs. So, as you know, the good news is in August, the economy created 315,000 jobs, which is important. We have created nearly 10,000 million jobs since President Biden took office, uh, which is the fastest job growth in history. So you're asking me. 10,000 million well, jobs. Well, uh, maybe she didn't pass math either. Maybe she got a D-plus as well. What was that again? We have created nearly 10,000 million jobs since President Biden took office. 10,000 million. Is that a big number? That's a really big number. Yeah. I think that's maybe more jobs than there are people yeah. in America or the world. Wow. So uh, everyone has, you know, spare jobs. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you know, that was a, a little snafu by yeah, Korean yeah, Jump yeah, here. Yeah. That's an old clip. We may have played that before, but uh, it's still yeah. funny. It, oh, yeah. It's hilarious. And it just goes back to we've talked about this before, but this idea that the government can create jobs at all really is, is ludicrous, is insane. And every president says that. I mean, Trump said that Biden said he that. was Obama wrong. Said that. He, they're all wrong. The economy yeah. and she even said it when she started the thing, the economy created. Right. So all government can do is either make it harder to create jobs or make it easier to create jobs. Yeah. And if you think this administration is making it easier to create jobs, you're smoking something that may soon be legal in Missouri. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So good news and, and you know, give California some kudos on this. I didn't realize they already had eleven of these desalinization plants. Think of about that. California is going through the worst drought in 1,200 years. Again, I will point out to you that this planet is 5 billion years old. 5 billion years old. How long have humans been part of this? 
Who knows? The planet is constantly changing. So California is going through a drought. You know, you, there no two ways about that. So what they have just off the coast is the Pacific Ocean. Isn't this planet like three-fourths water? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a lot. And a lot of it's salt water, so you have to desalinate it. And California regulators are expected to come around on this and approve their 12th desalinization plant. It's an actual solution to a problem. I have to, I have to uh, correct you because you made the same mistake that I made in saying desalinization. It's desalination. We, we keep throwing, it's a hard word. I keep throwing that extra syllable or two in there, desalinization, but it's not. You know, later in this podcast, we're going to be talking about deliverance. So what I should have said is, they're going to take the salt out <laughs> of the water. They're going to take it out. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> there you go. File that away because you may need that uh, in the future here. want to thank uh, more sponsors here. And of course, you know, we love having these folks with us. Jim Dingman at uh, Funhouse Pizza. He's got two locations. We've done two live events. Uh, we've, we've been to both of his locations, Lee Summit and Blue Springs. And we had a great time being live at both of those locations. And uh, he's, he's a great American. And I know he hates this, this, um, uh, uh, marijuana uh, initiative yeah, that's going to yeah. be voted on um, because his Blue Springs location is like next to a head shop, right? Oh, is it really? Yeah. I did not know And that. it's like you go in the bathroom and it's like, what does that smell? That's right? funny. Yeah, you posted something about it on our uh, Facebook oh, page. Oh, he was all over and that. And he like in all caps commented yeah. on it like, we don't need the, you know. Like, yeah. it's like He's like stink on hot. ugly with that. Yeah. So 50 Highway in Lee Summit, 7 Highway in Blue Springs, Funhouse Pizza, tremendous pizza. It's a fun place to hang out. Take the family out there. And uh, please, again, tell Jim Dingman that you support the podcast and you're glad that, that he's part of it. Uh, that's Funhouse Pizza with us on this podcast. All right, we move into the uh, next segment here, and that is the political shenanigans. And, Kurt, we, we've got, what, three weeks to go until the midterm, three weeks from today? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's actually, it's funny. It's coming up fast now. Like, you you always start the podcast, as people who listen regularly know, you always start with how many days left until the midterm elections and sometimes how many days left until the presidential election. And it's like hundreds of days you know, dozens of weeks, and then all of a sudden, now we're here. So, well, and I, I will say this to our friends who are Republicans who are going to win and take that majority. And I think we'll get both houses with the way people are thinking about this and looking at this election. Uh, we're going to hold your feet to the fire. Uh, we've only done this podcast since Joe Biden was inaugurated, and he was inaugurated with majorities in both houses. And what we've said a hundred times on this podcast is Democrats are running toward the cliff at light speed and Republicans, when you have the ball, you're running at uh, the speed limit, right. uh, but the destination is still the same. So we're going to hold your feet to the fire. There are going to be things that we're going to expect you to do that you should act like conservatives and get a handle on this uh, government. But trust me when I say this, that the Democrats are going to pull every stop, every rabbit out of a hat in order to stop this red tsunami that's coming. And I will give you, we're going to go through point by point the things that they're doing. And maybe, Kurt, you've thought of some things I haven't thought of. But the day the inflation, the last inflation number that comes out before the midterm election, the day that came out was the day that the January 6th committee had a meeting and they decided they were going to subpoena Donald Trump. I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena She's so self for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Okay, well, let's let's talk about the reality of this. That is going to be the last January 6th meeting. You know that, right? No. That's, no it's way. going to be the last one. That's, no they way. even said it was going to be the last one. <laughs> it's like it's like saying uh, you know, they they have this uh this new Halloween movie that's coming out right. I think this Friday and it's called Halloween Ends. It's and last it's like, Friday. It's oh yeah, whatever. It's like it's the last Halloween movie or you know the the uh, latest Star Wars trilogy. This is the end of the saga. It's like, hell no. Hell no, it's not the end. They're going to keep doing this until they can anymore. Just like they keep coming out with every new Marvel movie rehashing the same tired old shit over and over again well, they because may have. they make money. Exactly, but here's here's the, the, the math on this, the calendar on this. They don't have any more meetings scheduled before the midterm election. And the day that happens, everybody's going to be focused on 2024. The day after the election, it's the run for the yeah, presidency. Yeah, but who's the presumptive nominee for 2024 for well, the Republican Party? If the red tsunami happens, as we think it will, 
especially in the House, they won't have the authority to call these meetings anymore. Then the flip gets com- uh, the script gets completely flipped, and we'll get into that here in just a second. Yeah, That's why I'm saying. And then plus you've got Trump who can drag this thing out forever and ever. Now I think it'd be great television for Donald Trump to go there, pop the popcorn, man. Yeah, he'd light those people up like the Fourth of July. Yeah, no, I, I think it would be great. I mean, I think politically for him it's a terrible idea, and he should ab- absolutely avoid it like the plague. He shouldn't even respond. Honestly, he, he should just ignore it if he wants to be smart politically, but. Uh, in terms of entertainment value and you know good TV, I mean, I think it would be the best TV we've seen in a year or more. It certainly it would. would. I mean, fantastic. It, <laughs> and I've talked about this before. If he wants to be president again in 2024, I've given him the blueprint for how to do that. Stuff all this shit about the 2020 election into a sock somewhere. Take your phone away and just go out there into these rallies and say, "Here's how it was when I was here. Here's how it is now." Right. That's right. all he has to do. But he can't do it, Kurt. Yeah. He can't do it. Yeah, and what we're going to talk about some some polling uh, later. And you know, Trump is still very unpopular, broadly speaking. Uh, now he's very popular with Republicans, obviously, but across the board and with independents, he's not very popular. So he's going to have to figure out a way to address that if he wants to um, get elected again. Much like our current president, he's not very popular with Democrats right now. They yeah. want another nominee. So we'll get to that in a second. Okay, the next shenanigan that's going on here is this whole student loan uh, forgiveness program, which the president calls a game changer for millions of Americans. Not me. How about you, Kurt? Is it a game changer for you? Well, I'm eligible for it, but it's not going to make that much of a difference. Well, okay, fine. Um, where's where's the mortgage forgiveness? Because that's right. where you might be able to get me. But but this, and, and it's also so probably exceeding his authority as president. That uh, has not been adjudicated yet. 100% exceeding his authority because what, what they tried to explain this as before is the under the, you know, some vague emergency powers that the president has, you know, that, that he can... He that can, came uh, out of 9-11, by the way. Right, right. And so they're trying to attach this to COVID, saying that we're still dealing with COVID and it's a national emergency and therefore... He has the authority to do this, which he shouldn't have that authority to begin with. You know, uh, I mean, we've talked a little bit about on this podcast, but certainly I know that I believe the there was a, a giant, you know, overreach of the federal government into private life after 9-11, including the Patriot Act and national surveillance and everything else. All these extra powers that Homeland came, Security. Yeah. All these extra powers that came out of 9-11 that are totally illegitimate. Uh, this just being the latest extension of that. But um, yeah, and I don't, I don't think he's going to really get any challenge to it whatsoever. And it's something else that I've mentioned on this podcast. You know, we talk about, oh, the president, this is unconstitutional. The president doesn't have the, 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 power, the, the power to do that. Okay, well, two things are true at the same time. Yes, it's unconstitutional, but also he has the power to do it because he's in authority and he's going to do it and no one's going to stop him. So that's the definition of having the power to do I it. I think there are challenges going through the courts right now. They're, they're, they're going slowly. We'll see what happens. But this is where, you know, the president kind of stepped on his own ice cream cone, if I can use that analogy. <laughs> um, you know, when he said on 60 Minutes that the, the pandemic was over. Right. That's why the White House went into, you know, uh, damage control, because they're doing this under the, the authority granted because of the COVID emergency. Right. So we'll see how all that does. But this is just something else they're doing. It works, Kurt. They go out and they buy votes. Oh, yeah. And that's 100%. exactly what they're doing here. 100%. Okay. So on to uh, the Saudis, because the Saudis released this. Oh, boy. And this, I'm telling you what, this is like uh, the height of hypocrisy, which we're going to get into. The Saudis now say that when Biden met with them, he asked them behind closed doors to keep production high through the midterm, so that gas prices would remain low. Now, why did he think they wouldn't release that information? I don't know. I mean, it it goes back to this thing of like, well, the Saudis are our allies. I mean, kind of, I guess. I mean, they're they're sort of friendly in the region, but, um, you know, I'm becoming more isolationist really by the day. And like, why do we need these people? I mean, well, we should be producing our own oil. Right. We should you be. Know? We should absolutely be producing our own. But just in a geopolitical sense, Biden has gotten back in bed with the Iranians. You right. talk about the enemy of my enemy. Uh, the Saudis don't like the Iranians at all. Right. So on top of this now, so the Saudis screw him. They get him to drain a whole bunch of oil from the strategic reserve. 
And then they come out with their deal of they're going to cut production. So they screw him just before the midterm election. And so what is uh, Biden going to do now? He's going to withhold military support, you know, uh, weapons from our ally in the Middle East, yeah. Saudi Arabia. And we'll see from this clip here that I'm about to play uh, from Jake Tapper. He's trying to make it about Russia. He's trying to say that they're, you know, supporting Russia in some way. And therefore, we have to withhold military aid. But according to the Saudis and according to, um, you know, some leaked uh, communications and other things, it's it's more to do with the oil price issue than, than with Russia. But here's how, what he had to say on Tapper. But, but we should. We should. And I am. Uh, in the process, when the, when the uh, uh, this House and Senate gets back, there's, they're going to have to. Uh, there's going to be some consequences for what they've done with Russia. What kind of consequences? Menendez says suspend all arms sales. Is that something you'd consider? I'm not going to get into what I'd consider and what I have in mind, but there will be there will be consequences. The yeah. He's not going to get into it because he hasn't been told what to say. Yet. Okay, so let's roll the clock back to Donald Trump as president, and he has a conversation with the Ukrainians, right? Mm -hmm. And the hell that broke loose out of that. Here we go. A series of events that looks like extortion, withholding aid to an ally, and then, quote unquote, asking for a favor to 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 essentially benefit yourself politically. Quid pro quo, bribery. The bribe is to grant or withhold military assistance. The idea that somebody would withhold badly needed weaponry mm -hmm. for political reasons badly at home. Badly needed weaponry? Is that guy's just tail. a creeper. Just yeah. an absolute creeper. Yeah, he's a weird looking guy. And I, I mentioned this before, but, you know, he kind of reminds me of... Uh, <laughs> Of this. <laughs> okay, if you're just listening to the podcast, you're missing this. This is one of the characters from Deliverance, right? Yeah, the Banjo Kid. So the Banjo Kid from Deliverance grew up to uh, get, you know, become a fake Republican congressman and then get a show on MSNBC. So oh there you my go. gosh! You, you can really fail up, guys. You know, if you just uh, if you just pander hard enough, you, dun, can, dun, 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 you can go from the Banjo Kid to primetime TV. <laughs> All right, so there you go. So it's it's different, and they'll say, and that's that's one of the Democrat plays. It's different, right? You yeah. say it in your Karen voice. It's different. Yeah, nothing to see here, right? Yeah, nothing to see here. That is play number five in the Democrat playbook. In case you're wondering, um, there are reports out that Mayorkas, who is our um, Homeland Security, is that where he is? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another Department one of, those, of Homeland Security. Yeah, another Secretary. one of those departments that we would like to see folded when the Republicans yeah. take over. Um, okay, we we all heard the story that uh, the agents were down there whipping illegals as they came into the country. I'm not calling them migrants anymore. Screw that. Yeah, they're illegals. They're here illegally. Okay, there were reports that they were whipping them, and I'm not a horse guy, but everybody I talk to who's a horse guy says that those are the reins on the horses that they were, you know, and they they didn't didn't hit the, the illegals. They were guiding their horse, right? So my Orcus is told this. Yeah. He's told this before he goes out to the cameras. And then he goes out to the cameras because play number one in the Democrat playbook is always going to be about racism. Mm -hmm. It was on display last night in the Georgia gubernatorial debate uh, between Stacey Abrams and Governor Kemp down in Georgia because she made everything about race. This was totally about race. And then, of course, you get the president and the vice president out there talking about this is the worst thing that's happened since the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Because Jim they, they want to tie it to, you know, whipping brown people. Yeah. And Mayorkas, you know, you, you alluded to this, but um, we've played the clip before, so you can go back to the previous episodes and watch it. But Mayorkas went on TV and gave a press conference deliberately uh, or uh, directly after this happened and said that, you know, this is a terrible incident and we shouldn't be treating people like this and we need to look into it. And so now it's come out that he knew that there was no whipping or anything of the sort. And so he's basically, you know, just going on TV and using this for uh, as politics, you know, playing this like a political football, bringing race into it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because it's like the all of these district attorneys, these Soros district district attorneys that are like letting people out of jail. It's like he's he's deliberately doing the exact opposite of his job. His job is supposed to be to secure the homeland that it's homeland security you know he's supposed to focus on it's in the name protecting the country <laughs> securing the border <laughs> keeping bad people out right. who are going to be terrorists or you know drug dealers or whatever 
And he's doing the exact opposite. He is deliberately undermining our efforts to secure our country, just like these district attorneys in big cities like Kansas City or Baltimore or anywhere else uh, are deliberately, they're supposed to be prosecuting crime and putting criminals in jail. And instead, they're doing the opposite. They're focusing on getting people out of jail and letting people back on the streets. It's clown world upside down. Yeah, this guy should resign, uh, but he won't. No. uh, So he should be impeached. When the Republicans take over, the first thing they should do is impeach this clown. Yeah. Just get him completely out of there. Uh, because he's not protecting anything. Yeah. You know who does protect? Bob Watson. Hey. State Farm agent Bob Watson. Our he'll guy. protect your house. He'll protect your car. He'll protect you if you're a bad driver like I am. Um, he'll protect your life. Um, he'll protect your business with commercial insurance. He's a great guy. He's been my insurance agent for 27 years <laughs> through a lot of uh, turmoil between me and my kids uh, when they started driving. 7th and Main in Blue Springs, State Farm agent for five decades. And he's still very much in the game and loves what we do on the podcast. So when you call Bob to get a quote, because they've got uh, unbelievable rates right now at State Farm, call him at 816-229-7878. Surprisingly low rates, and you get an actual human being to answer the phone and a staff of people ready to help you when you need them most. Licensed in Missouri and Kansas. The office is in Blue Springs, but he can work anywhere in the metro. 816-229-7878. That is our guy, Bob Watson. Our guy. I wonder what he would say about Dr. Oz. We need to have that, uh, not uh, Dr. Oz who's running against uh, John Fetterman. Uh, Pennsylvania voters are going to get a chance to uh, do that. Do you remember when uh, there was an an actual felon running for governor of Louisiana, and he was running against a guy who was in the KKK, (laughs) and they had bumper stickers out that said, vote for the felon, it's important. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So, so now you've got Dr. Oz. You know, whatever you think of Dr. Oz, I've heard him speak. I think he he hits the points that need to be hit uh, with clarity. And then you get the guy who's running against him, John Fetterman, who obviously has had a stroke. Yeah. Well, now, I just I just want to say too, before we get into this video, I mean, there's there's some races where you just wish both people would lose, and I definitely feel that way about this race. I mean, if I I'm from Pennsylvania, I don't live there anymore. I'm I'm a Missouri resident now, so I will not be voting in this uh, Pennsylvania election. But if I were, I'd probably hold my nose and, and vote for Dr. Oz, just given the alternative. But man, I mean, he is like so weak. He he is the definition of a rhino. Well, you're he not- doesn't even live in the state. Yeah. He supported abortion. He supported transing the kids. He supported uh, big spending, you know, Democrat liberal policies his entire career. And now all of a sudden he's a Republican and he doesn't even live in Pennsylvania. So it's a, it's a joke. I mean, you may not like this because I know you're a Trump guy, but a lot of this stems back to Trump. I mean, he's the guy who got Herschel Walker running in Georgia. If we had any other Republican running against the guy down in Georgia, uh, that would be a 20-point race. And because it's Herschel Walker who played football for Donald Trump and their buds, he endorsed him. He endorsed Dr. Oz because he loves celebrities. Because they're friends, yeah. He loves celebrities. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, I think... uh, you know, obviously, Trump can endorse whoever he wants. I mean, that's that's his prerogative. And he's and, tipped and the he's, ball in their favor. Right. And then they get into a general election against a real politician. And Fetterman, my God, he's leading this race, I think, by a point, point and a half. Yeah. And the guy can't put a sentence together. Yeah, I think it's very likely that he's going to win. And this is the guy that we're sending to... Uh to Congress, so there you go. Uh, we had a monitor set up so that yeah, hold he could this feed just a second, just a second. Hold, hold the clip. This is the reporter on MSNBC who interviewed John Fetterman, and she's in trouble because she told the truth about what happened during the interview. Now the clip. My questions because he still has lingering auditory processing issues as a result of the stroke, which means he has a hard time understanding what he's hearing. Now, once he reads the question, he's able to understand. You can see You'll it. Hear You're he not also watching. still he has, has some uh, problems, some screen. challenges with speech. And I'll say, Katie, that just in some of the small talk prior to uh, the interview, before the closed captioning was up and running, it did seem that uh, he had a hard time understanding our our conversations. Can voters trust that you will be able to do this job on day one? 
Okay, he's reading now off yeah, the prompter. Of, of course. <laughs> what did she just say? Uh, uh, yes, of course. Oh, man. So, you know, in Pennsylvania, Democrats there are probably putting out bumper stickers, vote for the guy with the stroke. It's important. Yeah, yeah. It's just a sad state of affairs. You know, this is why people, man, we talked about this at the live podcast with uh, Mark McCloskey, who was in, I think, my opinion and your opinion, the strongest of the Republican candidates. Well, I voted for him. Yeah. And, you know, people need to get more involved in their primaries and they need to not just vote for who they're told to vote for by watching Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or anywhere else. Do your own research. Look into these people because we're, we're now we're at this place where we have like a fake Republican who is not going to govern conservatively at all. And if I had to guess, we'll probably vote with the Democrats on everything that really matters, all the issues that really matter. He's going to side with the Mitt Romneys, the Lisa Murkowskis, the Liz Cheneys of the Republican Party. And then on the other side, we have a guy who has literal brain damage, who can't re- who can't speak, he can't understand, he can't have conversations. He's like mentally disabled because of a stroke and we're going to send this guy to congress like yeah. what is he going to do he can't he can't participate in anything well what he's going to do is what chuck schumer tells him to do yeah your thumb either goes up or your thumb goes down exactly all right and maybe they'll even come and position it for him your thumb goes <laughs> this way <laughs> right, your thumb right. goes that way um yeah it's it's just and this is more of, of of what we're dealing with here in this election and you talk about doing your own research you know before a presidential vote okay just as a uh, a lark because I know where I am and I know what I believe, right? At my core, I know what I believe. But there's a website called selectsmart.com. Have you heard of that? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. Selectsmart.com. Um, it, you, it gives you a series of like 20, 25 questions, and not just the questions, but how important the issue is to you. Does this, that make sense? This one here? Um, no, that's not it. It's select smart. It may be selectsmart.org, but it's select okay. smart. But basically, it asks you the 20, 25 questions, and then how important is that question to you? And then it ranks your candidate in order. And, and it's always been right on the money for me because what I believe is what I believe. And and most they're, – they're, not most. There are a lot of people – um, who go in and they pull that lever because they're, they've always been a Democrat. Democrat. We're, we're a Democrat family, so we're going to vote for the Democrat no matter what. We're a Republican family. We're going to vote for the Republican no matter what. Y- you really need to do a little self-examination on what's important to you and then which candidate is best positioned to advance your cause. Now, I did vote for Mark McCloskey in that primary, uh, and it had nothing to do with his AR and, and all the things that he's famous for, you know, guarding his yard and all that over in St. Louis that he got in trouble for. I voted for him because he's a businessman who's done well for himself, and now he wants to serve one term in the U.S. Senate, go there and fix what's wrong in Washington, and then get the hell out. Right. Those are the kind of legislators that the framers intended to go to Washington. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, that's why I voted for him, too. I I did vote for him at least partially because of the St. Louis thing and the reasons why he's famous, because I think it's important that, you know, uh, we have people that have courage and can stand up to the mob. I mean, it's a it's a sign that, you know, somebody's not going to back down when they're under pressure. And I think that's very important as well. well. But uh, all, all of these things, you know, factor in and it's, it's policy too, for sure. I think, you know, if you did the select smart thing on Eric Schmidt versus uh, the Bush heir, heiress, who's running against him, it would probably tell you that you agree with Eric Schmidt 85, 90% of the time. Right. Um, so uh, that's going to be a no brainer slam dunk vote for me uh, in three weeks, three yeah. weeks from today. And in case you missed it too, we, uh, or I interviewed uh, Eric Schmidt for the podcast. This was back in the the Ray's Cafe saga days when we were uh, we went out and filmed at Ray's Cafe at the uh, big rally there, and he spoke, and we had a little uh, little snippet with him. So go back and watch that. Yeah. Okay, so we're still in the Democrat shenanigans, and this may be my favorite, and that is Barack Obama. I think he was on somebody's podcast, or does he do his own? Yeah, he was on uh, Pod Save America. Yeah. And basically, we tried to find the clip, but he just meanders. You know how Barack Obama yeah. is. He's all over the map. But the salient quote I'm going to put this up there so you can, we just have a picture yeah, of him. <laughs> the salient point in all that is he's telling Democrats, you got to stay away from this woke stuff. 
You got to talk about what voters care about right now. You can't you can't talk about the, you can't talk about abortion. You can't talk about the woke stuff. You know the pronouns and all that kind of stuff because you're getting killed on that. And yep. what people care about, you know, we're going to talk about it in the next segment. You know what they care about? They care about the border. They care about inflation. They care about crime. These are things that Americans care about that they're going to vote on, and Democrats aren't talking about it. Yeah. Well, he didn't mention those things specifically. I mean, obviously, he's not going to say anything about the border or crime. No, 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 no. But he's telling them but... to stay away from woke stuff. And and I find that you know hypocrisy is one of the things we built this podcast on. And if anybody started the whole woke thing. Right. It was Barack Obama. 100 percent. Yeah. You know, and I didn't vote for him um, either time that he ran, because, again, when you do the select smart thing or when you do your own research, you realize that if you're a conservative and you agree and you're a free enterprise, private sector kind of a guy like I am, uh, that he's not the guy who's going to advance your cause. Right. But I thought when he got elected, I actually teared up a little bit uh, uh, because I thought, man, this is the country that enslaved black people for a long time. We fought a civil war over it. We, we went through civil rights. We went through all the turmoil in this country in the 60s. And we get to a point where in 2008, we elect a black man to be the president of the United States. I thought it was a wonderful thing. I didn't vote for him. I didn't agree with him. But I thought for the country, it was a wonderful thing. And if anybody could get us beyond you know, be a post-racial president, it could have been him. And he made it 10 times worse, yeah. 100 times worse. Well, that should tell you everything you need to know right there. I mean, the fact that uh, race relations and and the race, racialization of policy got worse, not better, under the first black president, under Barack Obama, um, tells you everything to know, you need to know about him and the Democrat Party and their agenda. They don't the want. Heart- they don't want to solve the problem. They want to. They want to twist the knife deeper into the wound of American history, and they want vengeance. That's what they want. They want retribution and vengeance against the people that they think are the. Uh, the, you know, the, the bad guys in, in history. And it's, it's well, not true and it's ridiculous. To be a Democrat, you have to look at the world in two different ways. You're either a victim or an oppressor. Right. And we don't see the world that way. So we have a completely different worldview. But you remember when the Harvard professor, uh, the issue where he got arrested because they thought he was breaking into his own house. Obama went out before he had any of the facts and he said the police acted stupidly. Mm-hmm. The president of the United States said the police acted stupidly. Yeah, he also sent the uh, you know federal investigators into Ferguson, Missouri. Oh yeah. After it was very clear that Michael Brown did not have his hands up, did not say "don't shoot," was not walking away from the cop. That he and in fact strong armed robbed a convenience store and then was uh, was accosted by police in the street and then ran at the cop, tried to take his gun uh, out of the car and was shot for his trouble. And after all that had already come out. Uh, Obama was still, you know, pushing the the racial victimization narrative after the entire city of Ferguson had been burned down. And he sent in federal investigators to, you know, quote unquote, investigate racial disparity in the policing in Ferguson, Missouri. And yeah. so, yeah. You know, well, just- this is the guy who's telling his own party, you really shouldn't get into the whole woke thing because it's killing you here. I think right. he's trying to rewrite the whole narrative again, because that's also out of the Barack Obama playbook. Right. But, you know, the good news for Republicans with the red tsunami coming is um, the Democrats who are running the place now, uh, Joe Biden and whoever's running him, aren't listening. And evidence of that, um, Joe Biden Biden will be speaking about abortion today at a DNC event in Washington, which, you know, uh, if you looked at what voters who were going to determine the makeup of the next Congress care about, uh, what happened with Roe versus Wade is way down the list. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's really, you know, obviously Democrats, they don't really have anything to run on in the midterms, like positively. Um, They can say that they created 10 million jobs. Nobody really believes that. Um, I think people see right through that. They can't really say, you know, that they've done anything about crime or the border or the economy, broadly speaking. And so the only thing that they have to run on is op- opposition to, uh, you know, Donald Trump or rehashing January 6th or bringing up, you know, the the evil, bad Republicans. That's really what they have to run on. I mean, I think of those issues within that sort of category, I think the abortion thing is probably the strongest probably plays the strongest for them politically just because it is such a divisive issue and a lot of people uh, see it a certain way. And then the Democrats are also very good at framing these things, right? They're good at saying they, they frame the conversation not as about, 
you know, abortion or killing babies or protecting the unborn. They, they frame the conversation as about, you know, uh, reproductive health care or women's rights and things like this. And because they frame it that way, they have a much more favorable, um, you know, outlook in, in terms of polling and things like that. So that's going to play into it a big part, too. Well, my advice to Republican candidates is to stay completely away from that. You know, um, it, it will be determined at the state level. It's not a federal issue anymore unless Congress somehow makes it a federal issue. And the question I would ask Democrats is when you had majorities in both houses like you have now, why didn't you codify it in federal law? Yep. And, you know, if we get to a point where states are making these determinations and they say something like 15 weeks is the standard, how, what should the standard be, Democrats? Do you want to go all the way to nine months? Do you want to say after the baby's born you can make a decision at that point? I mean, what is the rule? What, what What's the standard? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't— I, I, I wouldn't fight it, but that's how I would fight it. I, I don't think that Republicans should stay clear of the issue. I mean, I think that they should lean into it and, and expose the— the real agenda of the left. And, you know, some of those questions that you just asked are perfect questions that should be asked on the campaign trail by every Republican that is running against a pro-choice Democrat. Well, certainly if it came up in a debate, that's that would be my counter. Right. You know, you're taking away our ability to abort our babies. Yeah. Well, what we're talking about is a 15-week standard. What do you think the standard should be? Right, exactly. That's a great question. And, yeah. you know, that not addressing an issue is a losing strategy because the left is, right now, the, the Democrats and the left are controlling the narrative on this issue they're controlling the the battleground of what we're talking about okay. and the framing of the argument so we need to fight back and you know uh, educate people you know well, i think people are not educated enough on this you topic. gave me a great transition to move into uh out of democrat shenanigans with three weeks to go uh until the midterm to the focus points for republicans based on what your voters really care about the things that you should be hammering every time you're out there on the campaign trail and I would start with the border, the border and the fentanyl crisis, because there's there's enough fentanyl coming in made in China through the Mexican border that Mayorkas isn't doing shit about uh, to kill every American. 100 percent. And they are killing Americans. And, and now it's coming across looking like candy. We've got Halloween coming up. I mean, how many kids are going to take something out of a Halloween basket that looks like, you know, some sort of uh, candy and they're going to take it and they're going to die? Yeah. And the narrative is already being set that, you know, this is not something that we need to worry about. Don't don't look, you know, nothing to see here. And that's just not the case. I mean, we have not only the, the drug problem coming across the border, but we have illegals coming across the border that are committing other crimes that are violent. Um, we had a woman that was just murdered a couple weeks ago uh, in Arizona or Texas, I believe. I forget. But yeah. So my Orcus is not doing his job. He needs to be impeached on day one. And uh, the, the border czar, our vice president, Kamala Harris, is just laughing it off. You know, yeah. it's like and she says, well, you know, I think we had this in the episode last week that um, Republicans didn't come to the table with anything. Why the hell would the Republicans come to the table with anything? You have both houses of Congress and the White House. Yeah. And she did more than that, too. She blamed the, the previous administration yeah. on the, the mishandling of the okay. border. Which is so the border hilarious. and the fentanyl crisis, which are one A and one B. And then you go to the economy. Inflation, energy costs. You know, Biden made a claim last week, and I don't know if you have this clip. I know you got another clip lined up here, but he made a claim last week that if if Republicans win, inflation will go up. Oh yeah, I can find that. How do you how do you make that nexus? Okay, inflation under Donald Trump was at like one point four percent. It was negligible inflation. Um, and it's gone, it's skyrocketed since he became president and started putting all the funny money into the economy, which even Barack Obama's economist said was the wrong thing to do. And he did it anyway. And, and God bless, uh, the guy in, um, West Virginia. Otherwise it would have been the Bernie Sanders plan. Um, at Here's least they clip, held, the at least they held the line, but play the clip where he says Republicans will make inflation worse. And not a single penny. No, I mean it. Not a yeah, single penny. Yeah, write it down. Republican wins. Inflation is going to get worse. Yeah. It's that simple. How? <laughs> How is it that it's simple? It's not a joke. It's not a joke, man. How is it that simple? Um, okay. And then the optics on this. I mean, again, if you're not watching on YouTube, maybe you've already seen the clip somewhere. But Biden's enjoying an ice cream cone. This is the leader of the free world. He's having an ice cream cone. And somebody asks him about the economy. I'm not concerned about the 
That makes sense. Yes. Our economy is strong as hell. Our economy is strong as hell. Yeah. Man, he really likes his ice cream, don't, doesn't he? He's digging that ice cream. Let's no watch, question about it. Let's watch that. another ice cream clip just because. Come on, Senators. Come on. Well, You've got your chocolate chip, man. Come on. Well, how are you? Okay. Do you know what you like? Oh, my gosh. I don't. Do you know what you want? I just. Uh, We're in the cherry capital of the world. I know that, but I'm a chocolate chip guy. Yeah. Yeah. Chocolate, 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 chip chocolate chip guy, guy man. Waffle you know, chocolate, vanilla chocolate chip. Vanilla there. Chocolate. there you go. Um. And no, he pisses me His off because face. he's he's, he's <laughs> like he is like literally like. Do you, do you know why he? You he, got some ice cream for me, man. <laughs> do you know why he pisses me off on something like this? Because he's skinny as a rail and he's eating all this ice cream that he wants. He eats ice cream and I gain weight. I mean, this is just not fair. It's not yeah, fair. well, when you're you know 78 years old or however old he is and you have dementia, you probably <laughs> might lose. And weight remember too. on the campaign trail, that was about the toughest question he got. Yeah, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Yeah. Uh, and so now he's our our president. Okay, so the border, fentanyl together, the economy, uh, they should be hammering the economy because this is the Joe Biden economy. He can spin it any way he wants to. Uh, it's the Joe Biden economy. And then you go to crime. Mm-hmm. You know, here we are in Kansas City. Uh, there was a double murder yesterday. There was another murder. Uh, it's like every day there is carnage in this town. And I know it's it's every big city in America. Yeah. Yeah, we. I just posted something about it uh, on our Facebook page. Which, if you're not following us, make sure to go follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and uh, Twitter. And the mayor of Kansas City went on Facebook and said, "You know, we're doing, we're making so many improvements in Kansas City. We're doing this, this, this. No mention of crime because uh, crime is surging in Kansas City. We're close to the record-setting year that we had in 2020 in terms of murders and other violent crime in the city. And uh, I just pulled some quick statistics and posted them to our page, but the uh, violent crime rate in Kansas City is worse than 98.1% of American cities. It's crazy. You know, and again, we're not uh, putting these people in jail. We're turnstiling them with uh, no cash bail. Um, And that's another thing that the Republicans need to be hitting. The other the next thing they need to hit is just overall corruption. Yeah, Uh, this is something that was completely ignored in the 2020 election. The laptop was, you know, uh, it was disinformation. And they had all these people lining up to say it was disinformation. No, it was true. And uh, you and I can disagree about Hunter Biden and, and what his relevance is to all of this. The only relevance to me is his ties to the president, the right. vice president at the time, and the president of the United States, the big guy who denied knowing anything about Hunter Biden's business dealings. There's been a voicemail that's been out there for a while now of the president acknowledging that he knew everything about Hunter Biden's deals. Oh, of course he did. And I mean, he's the big guy. <laughs> how could you not? He's the guy who's getting kicked back however much money. Yeah. And the corruption, and with China, China is our biggest problem right now. They talk about Russia a lot. Russia, in terms of population and what they're able to do, I mean, Ukraine is definitely an example of what they're not able to do. China, wouldn't you agree China's our number one competitor? 100%. Yeah. yeah. It's not even close. So China is sending fentanyl in through the Mexican border. They are destroying us on education. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're destroying us on the economy. And we've got a president who can't really do much about it because of his son. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it begs the question, you know, obviously his son is his own person. He can have his own business dealings, but you know, he's getting all these contracts. You know, if you're just listening to this and not watching on YouTube, uh, 83,000 per month from Burisma own stake in Chinese private equity firm, receive $5 million from Chinese oil company, uh, CEFC. And these is just the top line things. You know, there's much more when you dig deeper down into it, of course. But like the guy has no experience in these industries, you know, like the Burisma thing, people were pointing this out when the laptop came out and when people were talking about Hunter Biden leading up to the 2020 election, how did he get this job? He has no experience in energy or in, you know, upper level management of right. like a huge company. Well, so how did he get the job? You know, I, obviously it has to have something to do with yeah. the fact that his dad is the vice president, you know, right? I, mean, I would push back there, Kurt, and say that that happens on both sides, Republicans and Democrats. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And Republicans, you know, if a Republican was vice president or president and their kid got a leg up because of that, it happens all the time. Uh, George W. Right. Bush's daughter became a correspondent for NBC. Right. But and she didn't have that background. Yeah, no, 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 no. There's a difference between becoming a correspondent on M- and trust me, I'm I'm as big of a Bush critic as anybody. Okay, but there's a difference between becoming a correspondent on NBC 
or running for office or, you know, becoming a political consultant or working on K Street and getting a job with a Ukrainian energy company that it, and, you know, every single major outlet in America was pointing out how corrupt the Ukrainian government is until five seconds ago when, you know, Russia decided to invade. And all right. of a sudden, Zelensky is the national hero and he's up for the Nobel Peace Prize and everything else. Or China, our biggest global enemy, you know, uh, that's different than getting an M MSNBC, you know, uh, <laughs> political. OK, well, you know, maybe that was a bad made. example, but the Peter principle is out there and it's who, you know, in this world. And, and if you yeah, can tie corruption true. to Joe Biden, if you can make it stick with the Republican Congress, I'm all in. And I think those hearings ought to start in January. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think we're on the same page there. Um, and then the other thing that I would say to uh, Republicans that they should be focusing on is what's happening all around us with this whole wokeness and equity agenda. Mm -hmm. They are running play number one like it's the only play in the book. Everything is racist right now. And again, last night from the debate uh, down in Georgia, I should have mentioned this earlier so we could pull some clips, but Stacey Abrams was all over uh, Governor Kemp about how he doesn't care about black people. There's no equity agenda. Uh, he doesn't want black people to vote. And of course, Kemp's uh, reply is more black people voted here than ever before. We're trying to make it easier for people to vote. I want everybody to vote. I do. He does. But Stacey Abrams is out there uh, just pushing that racial agenda. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's I, I'm, I would have to actually listen to these clips. I don't. Maybe we'll do that, that next time. Yeah. But um, it, it definitely happened last night. And Stacey Abrams, who by the way, they got her to finally concede during the debate. It's like she never conceded. We played that super <laughs> clip of her last week. She said she did mention that Brian Kemp is the governor of Georgia. It only took four years. Yeah, only took four years. <laughs> okay, so the wokeness and equity agenda. I think Kurt, that's enough. And if the Republicans go out there and sell that and sell it hard. Uh, we're going to have a red tsunami. Yeah, yeah. And I will t uh, cite this, the New York Times Siena College poll, the latest one uh, that had Democrats at plus one in September, now have swung the other way, and now it's a four-point lead for Republicans going into the midterms. And when you've seen a sea change like that, as people are paying attention, I mean, the number of seats, especially in the House, it it's going to be devastating. Yeah, we have here... Uh Democrat candidate, this is for the midterm elections, uh, percentage that say they would vote for the Democrat candidate, 45%, percentage that say they would vote for, for the Republican candidate, 49%, which, uh, as you mentioned, is a, is a swing from the one in September. And then the big one that we always talk about, too, is the right track, wrong track, 24% right track, 64% wrong track, so... And the, have it. Actually, the wrong track's gotten better because it was higher. It was 74, 75% wrong track. Mm. Um, I can't believe it swung that far. Joe but Biden again, approval, uh, net disapproved 58%, net approved 39%. And again, we're the 39% who think he's, he's knocking <laughs> right. it out of the park. Right. What's going to happen? You know, here's my prediction. We make a lot of predictions on this deal. If the Republicans do what we think they're going to do in three weeks, um, the day after it will all be about 2024 and who the Democrats are going to nominate for president because it will not be Joe Biden. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we want to thank uh, Bob Watson, who's been with us for a while here on this podcast. Uh, he's not only a great state farm agent, he is, I know, because I've had him for 27 years as my state farm agent. Um, he's also a fan of the podcast. Uh, he came to us. <laughs> we didn't go to him. He came to us and yeah. said, what can I do to help? Uh, so what you can do to help us, if you're a fan of this podcast and you need insurance or it's time for you to review your insurance options, give Bob Watson a shot at State Farm. Surprisingly low rates on auto, home life, commercial insurance. Um, I have boats on my list, although with as cold as it's been, I don't think we're going to talk about boats anytime soon. <laughs> but maybe next spring when you get the pontoon out and you need to insure it, Bob Watson is the guy for you. He's licensed on both sides of State Line Road, 816-229-7878. And, you know, if you want to talk about anything we've talked about on the podcast, Bob will bend your ear about that as well. Uh, a great staff of people, again, I know because I've been with them for nearly 30 years and they've taken care of me uh, numerous occasions. Bob Watson, State Farm Insurance Agent, uh, we're proud to have him with us on our podcast. Now, we're going to leave you with this, and this image may be disturbing. If you're watching this on YouTube, this may be disturbing, Kurt. Yes. Uh, but this is our president doing what he does. This is not from long ago. This is recent. This is just what he does. He likes to get up behind young ladies, right? 
yeah. and you'll see it on the video. And if, boys sometimes, and, too. You'll see it. Um, he'll see the left hand coming up for the shoulder, and then he's going to whisper in her ear, and she's going to look at him like, what the hell? <laughs> This guy knows that it's coming too. Very oh, there it is, the left hand. It's hey. up there. No serious guys are 30. Okay. <laughs> no what? No serious guys to your 30. I'll keep that in mind. And then the Secret Service guy comes in and is like, eh, you can't record that. <laughs> <laughs> Yet it was recorded yep. and it was released. That's creepy Joe Biden. Three weeks to go until the midterm as we leave you with some shots of Joe from last week and Joe at other times where he's getting creepy with women. This is Dale Carter's America. The views expressed on Dale Carter's America are Dale's and Kurt Wheeler's. They do not necessarily reflect the views of KFKF or Steel City Media. Comments can be sent to dalecartersamerica at gmail.com. Check back for weekly episodes. Subscribe, spread the word, and give us a five-star review. Thanks for being a part of Dale Carter's America.